grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome as we gather to worship God this morning here at Park Lake. I invite you to take the red pads that are on the end of the pews and reach down, grab one, sign it, leave your name and email address and pass it back and forth. If you see someone coming in a little bit later, feel free to hand it to them so they have an opportunity to sign it. You can read it and greet each other by name during the passing of the peace, but I hope you'll leave us that information so that we can reach out and let you know some of the things that are going on in the life of the church. I call your attention to the various announcements that are printed in the bulletin, announcements that give us an idea of ways that you can join with us in this journey of faith. We'd love to have you be a part of that. There is a regular stated meeting of the session immediately following the worship service this morning, and so uh, I hope that you'll uh, touch base with any elders if there are items of business that you would like to have brought before the session. Just want to let you know, uh, Helen just mentioned to me that today is the 55th wedding anniversary of Clay and Gail Sherrod, who are here this morning, and they're our neighbors as well, and uh, we just wanted to extend you congratulations. <laughs> if you may not know, Clay and Gail just live right across the street from us, and so they come over and give Helen and myself marriage counseling tips all the time to, to try and make sure we can get it to 55 as happily and as wonderfully as they have. Let us now prepare for worship in a time of silent reflection. 
we are called to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are our We are our people, and his sheep Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the welcome that you give us as we enter into this holy place, a place set aside for our hearts to meet your spirit. We pray that you would calm our anxiousness, that you would help us to set aside our distractions that we might commune with you in a way that our heart longs for. Be with us in our time of worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. After that, it's almost like we should remain standing, but uh, we turn to the scriptures of Exodus in the Old Testament. This is beginning in chapter one, the, the Israelites in the midst of slavery, and yet still the spirit is at work, and we'll see how. Listen for God's word. Exodus 1, beginning in verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, 
He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians came, became ruthless in opposing tasks on Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that were imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of them was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile but you shall let every girl live. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes God draws us out of circumstances that we have found ourselves in doors that seemed closed and opened them in ways we did not expect. We come in our time of worship to a time that we draw near to God, admitting those ways that we have found ourselves stuck and, and not seen God at work, not trusted God at work. But God reaches out to us still. Let's pray this prayer together. Loving and merciful God, you know our hearts and you know our lives. We confess to you our actions and words that cause separation and animosity between us. We confess our attitudes that cause pain in others. We confess our easy acceptance of words and thoughts that cause distress and fear. We confess our ways of living which break down the lives of others and the life of creation itself. We confess our part in all these things. And in humility and hope, 
We ask for your help to do better, to reconcile, to heal, to soothe, to build up, so that we may love you and our neighbor and follow Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus to us, not to condemn the world, but in order that we might be saved, healed, forgiven through him. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As you are able, stand and share Christ's peace with one another.
I invite the children who are here to meet me on the front steps. that I read about um, from Exodus about the Hebrews who were in slavery in Egypt, that um, one of the problems was, did anybody hear me read what the problem was? What was the problem, Rebecca? That's right. When the Hebrew women were giving birth, um, there were two women, there were midwives. Do Do anybody know what a midwife is? Know what a midwife is? Know what a midwife is? It's somebody, not a doctor, but someone, uh, uh, someone who helps women to give birth. So they're, they're like a nurse or a doctor, but, but they're specifically trained to help women give birth. So this was a long time ago, and these women were specifically trained. The Pharaoh said, when you're helping women give birth, the Hebrew women, if it's a boy, what were they supposed to do? That's right, they're supposed to kill him. If it was a girl, let them live. It was an insult to both boys and girls. But um, so the Hebrew women, Shifra and Pua, they, they were Hebrews themselves. But the most important thing here is it said that they feared God. They feared God. They were God fearers. I mean, they were followers of God and they believed that first of all, they served God, not Pharaoh. So when they were helping the Hebrew women to, to give birth, what did they do instead? What? Right, they let the boys live. They did not follow through and kill the boys. They let the boys live. And as a result, the end of the story is who is born. There was a boy that was born. It was Moses. Moses who would end up delivering the people, Israelites, out of slavery. So imagine if they had followed through. Pua and Shifra, do you think that they could have gotten in trouble for doing what they did? But they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And they prevailed in what they were doing. They were really strong in their faith. They were solid. They were like rocks, rock solid in their faith. So that reminds me of a scripture Dr. Deanna is going to read in just a minute where Jesus is with his disciples. And there's one specific disciple that he calls rock. He says, you are the rock. So who is that? Does anybody remember who gets that name rock? Anybody? It's actually, his name means rock. Peter. He says to, Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock. What do you think Jesus means if he called somebody, you're the rock? What does that mean, Jonathan? What's that? You're one of the best. What, you're what? What do rocks, what are, what's the nature of a rock? This what? They sit there, they do this like a rock, you're like a rock. But okay, so so say it's in a positive way. You're a rock, not, oh man, you're a rock. You're a rock. What is it? You're a rock. You're strong, right? You're solid. Jesus said to Peter, not, you're like a rock. Although maybe there were days that Jesus would have said that to Peter because Peter was that kind. But he said this kind, you are a rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. That's where the church is going to start, on your solid faith in God. I want to hand you all a rock today. Here, take that basket. Take a rock. I want you to remember something today about rocks and what Jesus says about rocks and about people who have rock-solid faith. So we could say Shifra and Pua had rock-solid faith. So I want you to take a Sharpie. And on that rock, I want you to draw a cross that represents Jesus. So that that rock 
represents us. And the cross reminds us that we are rock solid in our faith and following of Jesus. I want you to take that rock and put it somewhere so that you can remember Shifra and Pua. You can remember Jesus saying to Peter, you're the rock. And on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And that that rock becomes your own way that you are growing strong in your faith in Jesus as well. You're the rock, Jesus says to us. Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for men and women of faith who, over all odds, stood firm like rocks and did your work and lived your will. Help us to do so as well. Amen. Thanks for coming up today. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. You can find this on page 17 of the Blue Pew Bibles, if you'd like to read along. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, who art our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the British television shows that I like to watch, which is becoming one of my favorites, is the British TV show called Call the Midwife. And it's a, a show that is set in the east end of London in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. It's a show about young nurse midwives and some other older veteran nurse midwives who live and work together with nuns of an Anglican convent in that part of London. And the convent is also part of a hospital. And the hospital is a a place for women to give birth. So you have these young nurse midwives and some older nurse midwives and also a variety of Anglican nuns all living and working together in the context of this hospital, uh, ministering to the impoverished people of this particular community. You may know some of the 
wonderful names of the characters, Trixie and Joan and Jenny and Sister Julianne and Sister Monica and others. They're all just delightful, wonderful characters. And of course, the kind of main plot of each show is how one of the midwives sooner or later helps a, a woman deliver and give birth to a child. But as I've watched all the, the different episodes of the different seasons so far, I've, I've started to understand that that really, in many cases, is just sort of the subplot of the show. What's, what's really going on in each of the episodes is the way that these young nurse midwives and, and some of the nuns and others are constantly ministering to this whole community and helping them through all the different kinds of problems and conditions of, of life of that time that just seemed to overwhelm them. For instance, there was an episode where a young mother was going to give birth to a child, but right before she gave birth to her child, her husband was critically injured in a workplace accident due to the poor working conditions of the dock where he worked. And as a result, he was blinded. And as a result of that injury, he refused to look and accept and be a part of the new child's life that was born to this young mother. And so the whole family was on the verge of falling apart and, and as a family they were in great need of the com community and, and so not only did the young midwife help the child to be born but she had to give of herself and of her time and of all of her energy to, to help this young family be healed, healed from the husband's injury and healed from the wounds of what happened in the workplace and, and it was about her helping the, the whole community to bring to birth something new in their midst. So many of the episodes deal with those kinds of, of dynamics. How, how is life found in the midst of conditions which often threaten to overwhelm a life and the, the people that are struggling just to hold on to it? So you hear the, the cry of the show, call the midwife, call the midwife. And these young women and the, the older women and, and the nuns and others they work, to, work with, they, they are heroically and sacrificially giving of themselves constantly to, to preserve life in this community and to bring forth life in this community in the most difficult of situations. Can you understand how I could hear that same call in the, in the midst of this Exodus passage, which we read this morning, call the midwife. Because that's really the plot, isn't it, of what's taking place? How will life be preserved? How will life be healed? How will life be nurtured and nourished and even born in the midst of conditions which have become oppressive and unjust and threatening and hateful. You can hear that call the midwife, that, that refrain beginning to emerge out of this passage which Helen read from the book of Exodus at the very beginning. It's a transition passage in some ways, a, a transition from the end of the book of Genesis and to the beginning of the book of Exodus, but it's a, a transition that, that reminds us of the the great change and the great shift that has taken place. Throughout the book of Genesis, it is the promise of God, God's covenant promise first made to Abraham, to make of Abraham a mighty people and to give to Abraham and to his family the promise of land. It's this covenant promise which runs throughout the book of Genesis. And, and the question is whether or not a variety of things were ever overwhelm or finally threaten or finally undo this promise of God. Can human conflict, human unfaithfulness, natural disaster, foreign powers, can any of these things which the people of God experience, can they finally overwhelm or, or even nullify this promise of God which runs throughout Genesis? As the book of Genesis comes to a close, we almost find it being celebrated that, that God's covenant promise 
is steadfast and sure, even as the people themselves have had to go to a different land entirely, even as Joseph has to bring his father and all of his brothers down to Egypt where he is located there and where he has risen to power, even there though at the book of Genesis, the promise of this people flourishing and surviving seems secure. You you remember how some of that happened? How Joseph's murderous and jealous brothers sold him into slavery and sent him down to Egypt and how Joseph there in Egypt had been imprisoned and how it was by the gift and his ability to, to dream and interpret dreams that he had risen through the ranks of power in Pharaoh's household. And Do you remember how it was that the skill of Joseph Uh, Joseph's ability to be a good manager had preserved the life not only for the Egyptians but for all the people in the midst of that region because a, a famine threatened to survive everyone. But through Joseph's wise planning, there was enough for the people of Egypt to survive and flourish. There was enough even for peoples of other regions to come to, to Egypt and receive food there, be given what they needed to live. And that, that was the case even for Joseph and his brothers and his fathers. So, so as we leave the book of Genesis and begin the book of Exodus, in many ways we're, we're still celebrating this steadfast promise of God that this would be a people which flourishes and survives and embraces God's goodness for them. The verses that we didn't read at the beginning of the book of Exodus, they they tell us how the people had grown, how the people had multiplied, how the people had increased in Egypt. And so the blessing of God's goodness and God's abundance carries across from Genesis into the book of Exodus. Until we come to that that ominous verse which we started with this morning. in Chapter 1, verse 8. A new king arose in Egypt who did not know Joseph. Well, of course, there was a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Years had passed, generations have passed, and no way could this current Pharaoh have literally known Joseph. But but what the story suggests is something much more significant, something much deeper. Here was a Pharaoh, here was a ruler who had completely forgotten the place and role of Joseph in the life of his own people. Here was a pharaoh, here was a ruler who had no memory of the significance of Joseph and the Hebrew people and how they had in fact enabled the Egyptians to flourish and survive in the midst of famine. Here was a new ruler, here was a pharaoh who couldn't remember, who had no memory of the other Pharaoh who had invited Joseph and his brothers and his fathers to come settle in Egypt and were given the land of Goshen, a wonderful place to live and survive. Here now was a new ruler, a new Pharaoh who had forgotten, who had no memory, who did not know Joseph. It signifies a huge shift, a huge change, something dramatic. Because now, once again, the people of God are facing not the assurance of God's goodness and God's blessings upon them, but they're facing again the threat of a, of a power, the threat and fear of a person who in some way is not a part of, has no memory, has no connection to the plan and the purposes of God which have been unfolding across this history. And when we run into a person like this, what seems to arise in great contrast to the assurance of God's promises of abundance for all, what seems to arise is this deep-seated threat and fear of a people who are different of a people who begin to make the ruler unsure and uncertain about his own security, his own well-being. 
And so this new Pharaoh, this new ruler, looks at the Hebrew people and says, they're becoming new, too numerous. They're, they're becoming too strong. There won't be enough for all of us. And so it's now at this shift as a new ruler who arises who did not know Joseph that the institution of slavery is again imposed upon the Hebrew people. The oppression of labor without the means to get things done that needed to be done is again imposed on the back of the people. The hard taskmaster is imposed on the back of the people because now again is a ruler, a king, a pharaoh. Who, who has forgotten, who has no memory, who does not know Joseph, who isn't connected to the promises of God's abundance and goodness for all. What's it like to be caught in a situation like that where we have no memory, where, where we have forgotten, we were no longer connected to our awareness, to our confidence in God's goodness and God's abundance. What becomes of us? What becomes of life around us? What becomes of the people we stand side by side with? Does fear, does hatred, does suspicion begin to make its way forward and become the order of the day, the reality of the day, the way people interact. And to that situation here in this story of Exodus, goes out the cry, call the midwife, call the midwife. It's Pharaoh, though, who calls the midwives, isn't it? It's Pharaoh who calls the midwives with his own plans and he tells them, Put to death any Hebrew boys that are born, but let the girls live. It's Pharaoh that institutes a new policy and a new plan to eventually eliminate the Hebrew people altogether, to push away the threat he feels from their very presence, to enable him to live in the midst of his own forgottenness, his own ability to remember, his own sense of non-connection to God's ways in the lives of these people. He tells the midwives, put them to death, any baby boys that are born to the Hebrew women. Helen read the text, and as she said to the children, the Hebrew midwives fear God. And it was a result of their fear of God, perhaps even their fear of God, which is greater than their fear of Pharaoh. They do not do what Pharaoh says, but they let the Hebrew boys live. And I've been wondering whether that simply is a case of the Hebrew midwives fearing God, being afraid more of God than they are afraid of the power of Pharaoh. I begin to think that's not really what is going on here. That's the limitation of our ability to translate this word fear into something different for us, a different way to live. Well, what if what's going on here is that the Hebrew midwives can remember their ability to imagine an alternative way of living in the freedom of God? in the freedom of God's promise of goodness and abundance, which enables them to not do what Pharaoh has ordered and calls them to let the Hebrew boys live. They turn and even play on Pharaoh's fears, and they say to Pharaoh, these women are too strong. They give birth before we can get there. It makes sense to Pharaoh. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought about those people in the first place. And so he issues just an edict that all of the Hebrew boys die, which brings us then into the presence of two more women, two young women, two girls perhaps. The mother of a young Hebrew, a young Hebrew woman gives birth and, and he, she takes the, the child that she gives birth to and wraps him up and puts him in a little basket on the river and, and tells her daughter the child's brother, to follow down into the reeds and watch. And there in the reeds, she's watching her little brother float along. Another young woman, an Egyptian woman, a daughter of Pharaoh, comes down to the reeds. And there, something happens between these two young girls as they stand there at the river. 
daughter of Pharaoh looks up and, and says, it's a boy. It's a Hebrew boy. And it calls forth his sister from the reeds. And she says, do you want me to, to take the child to, to a Hebrew mother and have the mother care for him in the time being? And they unhatch this new way of nourishing and nurturing and caring for life, a way that becomes an alternative to the threat of Pharaoh and to the death he wants to have instituted upon these people. Call the midwife. Call the young girls who can imagine even in the face of a mighty Pharaoh, an alternative way of living and nourishing and nurturing and caring for life that opposes the death of Pharaoh, the death of a king who cannot remember. Carl Becker is a famous American historian, professor of church American history, who taught at Cornell in the 20th century for many, many years. And he wrote that history is what the present chooses to remember from the past. Here in these stories, the people of God have chosen to remember the names of two young Hebrew midwives Shipra and Pua. It remembers their names and it remembers their ability to imagine a God who is greater than a Pharaoh. It remembers their ability to, to stand up and care for life and nurture life and bring forth life even in the face of one who commands death. It remembers two young girls or remembers a little sister who follows her brother in a basket as it flows down the river and when she sees another young girl, a daughter of Pharaoh, look and see and declare that this is a boy in the water, she steps forward to say, we can do something about this. We can help this child. Let me take it to a Hebrew mother who can nurse and care for it. And it becomes the, the way of a little boy to grow up and be one who nurtures and brings forth the people of God as they're freed from Egypt. What is it that we lose when we can no longer remember and be connected to our assurance of God's goodness and God's ways in the, in the world? Helen and I, we're at the beach this past week and enjoyed a few days there over on the west coast. And we stay in a spot that uh, sits right by a road where people can drive up to and unload and take out all their stuff and go directly onto the beach. And so often what we do is we put some chairs up under some trees and not only do we watch the water and the things going on down the beach, but we're watching the people come back and forth as they unload and go down to the beach. It's, it's as much fun, I think, sometimes to watch the people coming and going as it is to watch the things happening on the beach. One of the sets of people that came and went as we were there this week was a young mother and a father, and they had with them a child, I bet about 12 or 13 years old, a child who obviously had severe physical handicaps. Maybe they suffered from multiple sclerosis, I'm not sure, but, but it was a, a child that had to be transported in one of those full wheelchairs that go from head down to the feet. Obviously, the child could not do anything for themselves, could barely move, couldn't talk, just sort of made noises. And, and as we sat there and watched, I, I watched this young couple bring this child up in a wheelchair, come up to the sand and then unbuckle the child and then carry the child 50, 60, 70 yards across the hot sand and put down a blanket and then put the child down on the blanket and, and care for the child there and then eventually pick up the child, the two of them, and take the child down into the water and float together and let some of the warm gulf water go across the child's head and hair and, and all I could hear were the noises of the child, the, the kind of screams. I weren't sure if they were screaming of delight or fear or whatever going on, but, but just watching them 
for two, three days, do this. And I, and I found myself thinking each time that I watched them, how are they able to do this? How can they do this? Have they got enough uh, suntan lotion on that child's sunblock so the child's not getting sunburned? What, what kind of energy, what kind of capacity does it take to, to bring this wheelchair up to the beach and even have to lock it up to a wooden post so somebody doesn't steal a, a wheelchair and then have to struggle carrying this child through the hot sand? Is this a good thing or is it bad? I, I constantly was questioning and asking myself about all the issues that in my mind I was conjuring up that would be obstacles, that would be difficulties for caring for a child like this in this way. And I, I was just overwhelmed with the capacity of these parents and their ability to do this. But I just felt at unease and in a sorts of distress. And I couldn't understand why, why I was so bothered by it. And until finally it came to me and I realized that I wasn't able to imagine the joy and love that these parents must have been experiencing as they cared for this child in this way, as they gave of themselves and worked so hard to make something which just seemed like a normal everyday occurrence to me on vacation happen for someone they loved. I was, was just bothered by my inability to put myself in their place and understand fully their ability to imagine and embrace and live into a way of life that was caring, that was loving, that was different, that was free from all of the constraints that I kept building up in my mind about what could and couldn't happen and what was and was not good and what was and was not right. And I began to wonder what prison I was putting around myself as I could no longer remember, and could no longer fully trust, could no longer completely believe in the promises of God to provide abundantly and with good and with love and with care for everyone, no matter what circumstance, no matter what condition. What happens when we forget? When we no longer remember? When a king arises who did not know Joseph? When believers begin to live daily, restrained, and confined uh, by their own awareness and sense of the world's limitations and impositions and fears and hatred around them, and can no longer imagine the alternative of freedom and of goodness and abundance for all. Jesus had his disciples and he gathered them and he said, who do people say that I am? Oh, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say you might be this person, some. And Jesus said, no, it's not what other people are saying. Who do you say that I am? And Peter blurted out, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I would build this church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Really? Peter, of all people, these disciples, these fishermen, they're the ones the church is going to be built upon? They're the ones who will carry out the ministry and embody Christ? Really? You? You're the ones? Don't forget it. You are. What are you going to do? Amen. Let us stand and affirm what we believe by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we do face many closed doors these days. Threatening times where we see oppression and, and unjust and hateful ways people inflicting on one another. We see the, the rise and fall of of weather that threatens life. We're mindful today of, of our friends in Texas and of the flooding after terrible storms, those whose lives and livelihoods are threatened. We see the threatening and oppressive ways in the Middle East of, of those that we are friendly with and those whose uh, way of life are threatened by us and whom we are threatened by. And people in Africa and Korea, there is much to pray for these days, O oh God. Much to pray for where doors seem shut and closing tighter. But, O oh Lord, open our eyes, open our eyes and hearts to the work of your Spirit. Remind us that we are not alone in the living out of our days, that, that we are coaxed by your Spirit, counseled by your Son. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opening of new doors to us when the familiar ones become blocked and threatened and closed. Thank you for keeping us from dead-end streets and showing us the path to your hope. Help us to trust that you lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. And even though we walk through shadows of darkness, your inner light gives us confidence to follow the way to lasting hope. Confidence to embrace peace that passes understanding. Confidence to receive gifts of inconceivable joy. May we be bold enough to allow your spirit to work in our hearts, to whisper to our will, to light fire to our desire, to widen the scope of our vision of living. May we allow your spirit to move our spirits, to fear you so that we might do your work in this world. That is our desire and we are confident it is only by your working within us that we can do what you need for us to do. We place ourselves in your hands this day. Hear us, O oh God, as we continue our prayer, praying that which Jesus taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our worship continues as we present to God our tithes and our offerings. <laughs> 
now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide and keep us all now and forevermore. Amen.